Hello, this is Tammy Lasseter Clare, and today I'm presenting the pre-lab lecture for part one of tobacco analysis, which is the quantitative determination of cadmium and lead by anodic stripping voltammetry, or ASV. So the two metals that we're going to be looking at are cadmium and lead, and cadmium is a carcinic carcinogenic metal. Um, there's no acceptable exposure level, and so what that means is the more cadmium that you are exposed to, uh, the greater your chances are of developing cancer. Uh, lead is a known neurotoxin, which is especially bad for younger children. Uh, lead had been used to um, uh, as an additive into gasoline, and so it can often be found around roadways. And as well, it is the white pigment in paint that uh, predates about 1970. So lead carbonate was used as uh, the pigment in, in paint, and so um, it can be found in uh, your house as well. So now on to the method. I'll explain how it works. Anodic stripping voltammetry, or ASV, consists of two steps. The first step is the deposition step, where metals from your sample are deposited onto the electrode. The next step is the stripping part, where each type of metal, or each different element, is selectively removed from the electrode by oxidizing it, and then measuring the change in the potential of the solution. The potential change can quantitatively tell you how much type of each metal there was in your sample. So this is a three electrode measurement system where there is a working electrode, reference electrode, and counter electrode connected to a potentiostat that controls the potential or voltage that is applied to the working electrode. So the working and reference electrodes are used to define a potential or voltage in the cell. The voltage is applied to the counter electrode, which then allows current to flow from the working to counter electrode. So the goal is to keep the well-defined potential on the working electrode versus reference electrode, and then only allow the current to flow to the counter electrode. The counter electrode is, is where current is actually measured, and that current is proportional to the concentration of the metals in your sample. So current is, is actually what is being measured, as I said, but voltage is what you use to get the chemistry to happen. So imagine that you have a cup with a small amount of liquid, and that will define your cell. You'll see that the actual cell is quite compact with a little stir in the middle of it. And one thing that you should be aware of when you take the cell apart is that there is a tendency to want to invert the top part of the cell where the electrodes are, so as to put it down. But if any liquid gets poured out of the electrodes and into the stir motor, that could damage the cell. So please try to resist the temptation to put that piece down. You'll just have to hold on to the top part of the cell with one hand while you swap out the sample cup with the other hand. Or you can ask your partner to help position the, the sample cup while you hold on to the top part of the cell containing the electrodes. So the counter electrode is a piece of platinum wire, and the reference electrode is a silver uh, silver chloride electrode. You'll need to check to make sure that the silver chloride solution is full uh, within the glass housing and that there are no bubbles in the reference electrode. Um, so that'll take you a couple of minutes at the start of the uh, of the lab period. Now the reference electrode, or excuse me, the working electrode is a piece of glassy carbon, uh, which is conductive for reasons much like why uh, graphite is metallic, uh, due to the overlap of the HOMO and LUMO, or as material scientists call them, uh, the valence band and the conduction band. And so you'll start by uh, polishing the glassy carbon electrode to make sure that it is as clean and, and shiny and flat as uh, possible. And then before you actually do the experiment, you'll plate a thin film of mercury onto the electrode. And so the cup, the sample cup, before it actually contains your sample, will contain a solution of a fairly high concentration of mercury. And so you apply a large negative potential to the working electrode for a few minutes to reduce uh, the mercury onto it to produce a coating, a thin, a thin coating of mercury, um, that you then use for the rest of the experiment. So what goes on during the actual measurement part of the experiment? Well, first you apply a large negative potential. And in this case, negative potentials are plotted up rather than down. This is uh, the convention that is used here. So the large negative potential is applied onto the working electrode. And that reduces any metal ions onto that electrode. The purpose of the mercury is to help cadmium and lead adhere to the electrode by dissolving in the mercury film. So in the first part of the experiment, 
you do the deposition phase, and you run the deposition phase for as long as you need to. And so here we run it for about five minutes. The nice thing about the deposition phase is that you are pre-concentrating your sample onto the electrode. And during the next part of the experiment, the stripping part, you are removing metals from the electrode by oxidation. And if you don't get enough current, then you can go back and do the deposition part for a longer period of time. And the theory behind this is that the current that you measure is linearly related to the concentration of ions in solution and the time that you do the deposition for. Since you can't change the concentration of ions in solution, you can just deposit more of the sample onto the electrode. Then at the end of the deposition phase, you turn the potential around and run an increasingly positive potential to oxidize the metals that were deposited onto the mercury film. So when you do this, you are removing electrons from the metal in its zero oxidation state to make ions. And in the case of cadmium and lead, you will first see an increase in current as you oxidize cadmium into solution. And then once all of the cadmium has been oxidized, at more positive potentials, you will see another increase in current until all of the lead has been oxidized into lead ions. Here's another visualization of the two steps and what is actually happening chemically at each step. As you can see, the potential that is, that is applied to the cell exceeds the standard reduction potential of all of the metals of interest, and so everything is reduced onto the electrode during the deposition or accumulation step, as it is also sometimes called. Then in the stripping step, as the potential becomes more positive, each type of metal is selectively oxidized depending on its own oxidation potential. As each type of metal is oxidized and goes into solution as an ion, we see a spike in the current. As the sizes of the current peaks that you see are proportional to the amounts of each of the ions present in the film. The experiment is extremely sensitive to, to metal ions in the aqueous phase because of the pre-concentration step and because of the inherent sensitivity of the voltammetric experiment. And so you can detect part per billion levels of lead or cadmium. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the quantitation. So the quantitation method that we're going to use is the standard addition method. The first measurement that you're going to take is the raw sample with no standards added to it. So you do the deposition step and then the stripping step, and hopefully you will see one or two peaks corresponding to cadmium and lead present. If you see a peak that corresponds to cadmium or lead, then you will add in that standard. So if you see a peak for lead, then you'll be adding in spikes of the lead standard or if you have cadmium, then you'll add spikes of cadmium standard. If you see both peaks, then you need to add spikes of both. So the trick is you need to figure out how much of each standard you're going to use. You'll need to add spikes of the standard to your sample, but you don't want to have your first spike be twice as large as your original peak. So ideally, after adding your first spike, the peak should be about 10 to 40% larger than the raw sample peak. It is important to not add too much of the spike. You can always add more if the change in the peak size is too small to be noticeable. The next spike should make a peak that is about twice that of the original peak, and the next one after that should be three to four times as large, and then you need to make at least one more spike. You'll have to play around a little bit to see how much of the standard you need to add to get the peak size right. And so if you add too much, there's nothing you can do to fix that, unfortunately, but start over with a new sample. And there will be enough sample for you to repeat this twice, but there won't be enough sample or time to go beyond two repetitions. So do try to be careful and thoughtful about your spikes from the start so that you don't overshoot. And if you need to start over, fortunately, you will have learned a bit about how much of the standard you need to add from the first time through so that when you start off the second time, you should get it right from the start. So based on the method of standard addition, the first point corresponds to the signal from your raw sample. And then as you add more and more spikes, you have additional data points corresponding to your addition samples. So now you can use either peak height or peak area in your quantitation. In principle, peak height and peak area should give you the same result if your peaks are perfectly Gaussian in shape. Usually though, there is a slight aberration, and so peak area tends to give a more accurate result. But you can use whichever gives you a more linear response. 
As usual, you extrapolate backward to the x-axis intercept. And in this case, the software on the instrument that we're using does the rest for you, um, and it'll just spit out an answer in parts per million. So you need to take that answer um, back and calculate the concentration of the metals in your sample, um, scaling that up in case you diluted your original sample. Okay, So remember to take dilution into account. So then you'll have uh, that information to write up in your lab report about the effects of each type of heavy metal on human health. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope you have fun with this experiment.